nightmares in my head I fear Let the thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Titanic hit the iceberg at 20.5 knots, a smidgen below its average cruising speed of 21 knots, which meant that it, it probably only slowed down half a knot between the time the iceberg was sighted and impact. And that is nothing compared to the speed the bow hit the ocean floor. The estimated speed was 30 knots, seven knots faster than Titanic's maximum potential speed, the surface. The aquadynamics of the stern when afloat meant even when completely submerged, it cut its way down to the ocean floor, impacting it at a 20 degree angle. But you don't need to be an engineer to appreciate just how well Titanic's stern held up against that bone jarring impact when its keel smashed into the ocean floor 2.5 miles deeper down. If you compare images of the sharpened bow, which as I explained in the previous video on the Titanic, it was reinforced. It was designed to shield the rest of the ship against head-on collisions. If you compare that with the rounded stern, which wasn't designed for head-on collisions, well, they're like chalk and cheese. Have a look, the bow is mostly intact. Meanwhile, the stern is basically a heap of crumpled metal, as can be appreciated in this animation. Before we get to the rest of this episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. I'll be doing a follow-up on the specifically to the Titanic aspect of the narrative, so keep your eyes peeled for uh, new episodes. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button, and let's get started. So 11 years ago, National Geographic used high-quality computer simulations to contrast the impacts of both sections. To reiterate, what is clearly evident is even when the stern section has that teeth-jarring collision with solid earth, right, it's much harder than an iceberg, it still holds together. This suggests it may have sheared right through the iceberg if given the chance. So if this was the better option, if shearing through it, if ramming the iceberg was the better strategy, why didn't they do that? Well, think about it. If the Titanic hadn't been the ship of dreams, I mean, when the impact happened, it was 22 midnight, 2340. Most people were in dreamland, including the captain. You know, they'd had an 11 course dinner earlier that evening. Had the impending collision happened in broad daylight when people were up and about, passengers could have been warned to brace themselves, and the ship's engineer may even have had the opportunity to quickly instruct the captain or the pilot on the best strategy. Unlikely, because they really had seconds to decide what they were going to do, but again, if it happened in broad daylight, maybe they would have had more time. Another reason Titanic chose to avoid a direct hit was because it was intended as a super luxurious high class hotel. Think of it as the Ritz on water. And because of this, there would be every effort not to rattle the super rich guests. There were some very, very rich people on board. And of course, wealthy people are important people. And of course, the irony was that, you know, trying to avoid the iceberg, trying to avoid that that um, sort of brutal, horrible, bone-jarring smash, well, that caused plenty of rattle anyway, as the craft, the side of the craft, shivered and shuddered against the side of the iceberg. And then, obviously, there was a colossal inconvenience after that that went on for hours. So a direct impact would certainly be jarring and would cause cups of tea to spill and break, and obviously rich patrons to swear and mutter into their pillows, but that would have been the better option. The much bigger irony is that you've got a ship named Titanic, which is a name meaning exceptional strength. Well, they didn't use it. They didn't use the strength that was designed into this, this um, colossus. Think about the great momentum driving this enormous bulk 
They could have saved it and everyone else if the crew that were up and about that fateful night didn't lose their confidence. In other words, if hubris is what built Titanic, it was going to require similar hubris to drive her into that iceberg. But when the time came, as we all know, Titanic lost that game of chicken and so too did over 1,500 souls. Ultimately, it was the third class who paid the price for not wanting to upset the apple cart on the higher decks. Only 174 of the 710 passengers in third class survived. I'm not going to take it further than that, but I do recommend you watch the National Geographic animation. I'll put a link to that in the description. I'm also going to follow up this analysis with two more videos on Titanic before we revert back to Titan. The one video is to deal with this whole idea of even if the ship had ended up the way it ended up, in other words, if they didn't plow through the iceberg and all things being equal, they chose to use the iceberg as a sort of huge lifeboat, how would that have turned out? How many la lives could have been saved? And that is really going to be a fascinating um, uh, analysis. I've already prepared the, um, the script for that. I really can't wait to share that with you. And then we're going to end off this little foray into the old Titanic thing by looking at 22 sparkling insights that you probably don't know about. You might know about one or two of them, but I doubt whether you know I doubt whether you've heard of all of them. And so I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. I might do it as a live stream, um, but I might not. I'll, I'll see closer to the time. There's also so much more to deal with in terms of the Titan tragedy. I've actually recently found transcripts that David Pogue, we, he, all of his interviews with uh, Stockton Rush, he put all of those interviews in transcript form on the CBS website. And that is really pretty illuminating to look at as well. That's something that we can also, if we want to continue our analysis, we can continue looking at that aspect as well. I don't know if you know this, but the U.S. Coast Guard released a statement on Monday where they're saying that they're conducting formal DNA analysis of presumed human remains that have been recovered from the wreckage at the site of the incident. And so the remains could belong to one or more of the five people. Right now, the incident is being investigated by several agencies in the United States, in Canada. There is also help coming in from experts in, uh, from the U United Kingdom and France, uh, although the United States Coast Guard is leading the whole operation. And so what we really have is a massive investigation. There's a lot of information that needs to be assessed, analyzed, and figured out. Right now, they are still in the fact-finding phase, and this, is like, and this is likely to continue for some time. After that is complete, the Marine Board of Investigation will do public hearings. This board will have the power to issue subpoenas and um, order, make orders for evidence and even summon witnesses. And they will then testify in front of the public. Will we reach that point? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.